do me a favor in welcoming Pastor Josh Earls to the stage. Just a, a few minutes ago, I dropped the microphone on the floor, and I thought, I'm going to have to buy Daniel a new microphone. And so <laughs> he might be getting a new one out of that. Get you three. Get you three. <laughs> no, but it is great to be back with you guys. I always say this. The first time I ever spoke at Elevation, uh, we were, you were, I said we, I feel like I'm part of the family, in the theater at Ronnie's. Anybody from the Ronnie's days here? And Yeah, yeah. All right. The faithful. And it was the first Sunday where Ronnie's put in their reclining seats. And uh, I thought, this is going to be a good one. Are you all going to go to sleep while I'm preaching? And uh, that was uh, my first experience of preaching in a theater. Uh, that was a first. There's two more firsts that uh, I have here tonight night. I've never preached at night, always on in the morning, and I've never preached a revival service. Now, I've been to a few, more than a few. I grew up going to revival services, uh, tent revival. Anybody go to a tent revival? Anybody been to one? No, nobody? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. Five people, amazing. Yeah, okay, so this is the minority in here tonight. I feel, I feel good about that. So, tent revivals, and you say, what in the world is a tent revival? You do the same thing that you're doing right here. A church that has a building, that has air conditioning, right, that has all the stuff that decides in the middle of the summer to go down into their field, erect a tent that doesn't have air conditioning when it's humid, and you have service outside underneath a tent, and uh, it's a pretty amazing experience. God did a lot of cool things, but literally, they would take everything on the stage, all the instruments. I was telling Pastor Daniel tonight, we take, we had a Hammond B3. Anybody grew up with a, an organ in church? You had the piano on the left and the organ on the right. We take the Hammond B3. We take the Leslie cabinet. We take it down to the field and uh, it would be five days of nonstop services. I was a kid, but I have distinct memories, not of just how hot it was or me playing with the grass and then smelling my fingers and, and uh, doing all that, but of what God did in people's lives uh, in, that, in, that, uh, in that time. And I'll never forget for me, the, the biggest memory that I have is on my best friend, his mom, who was the principal of uh, the church, the school that the church had, and she was in her 30s at the time, and she got uh, de developed MS. She got diagnosed with MS, and she had been relegated to a wheelchair, and uh, they had started to build the ramps in the home and things like that to be able to facilitate her wheelchair, and they had a prayer line. Have you ever been through a prayer line? Not have someone pray for you, but you literally walk through this tunnel of people that pray for you, and she was being pushed by someone down the uh, fire tunnel or prayer tunnel, whatever they call that, and in the middle of it, she stood up and she ran out into the field, ran out of the tent, ran around the field, screaming and praising the Lord, and to this day, she's never been back in that wheelchair. And God healed her, yeah, of MS, and uh, that... That left a, uh, an indelible mark on my life to literally know that someone was wheelchair bound one moment and the next moment they're not and for 30 years uh, has never been back in the wheelchair. The power of God, that what he can do in someone's life. And so uh, Daniel asked me to speak at, a rev at this revival service and I thought to myself, that's really funny. Part of me is like, I, have, I never thought I'd be part of a revival service again. And you say, why is that? Because I, I kind of grew up and I, I thought to myself, you know, if I never go to another revival service, I think I'll be okay. I think I'll be okay. I grew up and I developed some kind of, I don't know, apathy or just kind of like, you know what, I don't know about all that stuff that I saw. Even though I saw a lady get up out of her wheelchair and run around, I thought, you know, I don't need all that emotion. You know, I just, I need to love God with my mind. You know, I need to love him with my mind. And I went the other way, went the other way, went the other way. Kind of, uh, I don't want to say I abandoned my roots, but I just put my roots off to the side, and I said, I don't know if I need that anymore. And what happened to me was in, in 2015, I went to India. I'd been a pastor for all of about, I don't know, five days, it seemed like. I uh, became a pastor in 2014. I was about a year and a half in. Went to India. We went to uh, work with a, a group there that they rescue women and children out of the brothels, and they had asked me to speak on Sunday morning at the church service. There was a Hindi service, and then there was an English service. And in the English service during worship, they were singing this song. It was, uh, I am the God that healeth thee. Anybody know that song? Don Moen, you sent your word, you healed my disease. And I remember they're singing that song, singing that song, and I just felt the presence of God in such a, a familiar way. Not in a contemptuous way, but familiar and I, the first words out of my mouth was, I've missed this. I've missed this presence of God, the power of God in my life. And it brought me right back uh, to my roots. And that started a journey on, for me to come back around to, to seeing the power of God and believing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and not that, that, here's what I learned. People are weird and the Holy Spirit isn't. Right? That's what I learned. People are weird. The Holy Spirit isn't. 
Holy Spirit isn't. And that began a, a journey for me to return back to my roots and to really just say, you know what, God, I'm going to cease of uh, being in control of my life and trying to tell you what to do, trying to tell you how to operate. And so I, he asked me to speak, and I agreed because he's Daniel, and he's my friend, and, and I love him. I'd do anything for him. And the other day, my wife was asking me, so what are you going to preach on? I said, well, you know, I've been preaching in this series of Nehemiah, and I think one of the messages is going to work really great for the revival service. And my wife said, why don't you just pray about it? Why not try to be efficient, you know? And uh, just because the message was good there, why don't you pray about it and ask God to see what he wants you to speak on? I'm like, all right, I'll pray about it. And here's what I felt the Lord asked me to, uh, to impress upon me to speak about is the baptism of the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues. Now, if you know me, and Daniel does, that's probably the last thing he ever thought I'd preach about. It was not on the top of my list. Now, I'm very familiar with it, you know, and I thought, that's the last, no, that had to be God. So I was like, I'm going to give God, I'm going to give you another few days. Let's see if you change your mind. Let's see if it's just me. And he didn't. So I called Dan and said, hey, what do you think? He said, go for it. And so that's what I want to talk to you about tonight is speaking in tongues speaking in tongues and I want to ask this question from the beginning is this is how many of us you don't have to answer it it's just a kind of rhetorical question think that speaking in tongues seems a little bit weird seems a little bit outside of our comfort zone seems a little bit uh, maybe outside of our theological comfort zone maybe for some in here tonight speaking in tongues is you think no it's done it's over with it has ceased it doesn't exist anymore that was a thing that they did in the book it's not a thing that we do here today so I don't know what theological persuasion that you come from what background you come from I'm not here to dog any of that I just want to take a look at it in scripture I'm going to ask you to consider what that means for you today in your life and here's the thing that I grew up with we had revival for a week, and then we packed everything back up and went into the building, and it seemed to stop. One of my biggest questions as a kid is, why do we do all this? Why do we get excited in the field and go back to the building and it's business as usual? And then revival seemed to me to become something we put on the schedule. We're having revival in August. Why? Because that's when the dude could come. And it was like this weekly thing. I understand the heart behind it, but I, wanna, I want us to begin to consider that revival isn't something we put on the schedule. Now, I believe that God called Pastor Daniel and, and his wife to, to do this and to set this week aside because God was going to start something here. God was going to birth something here, right? And it's going to continue on. This isn't just a, a scheduled thing. This is a God thing. Is he going to do it next year? Are they going to do it again? I don't know. But how do you live your life in freedom and in power and have a sense of revival, renewal every single day? And I want to contend with you today that it is the Holy Spirit. It is the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And I want to offer this thought to you today that it is possible that the speaking in tongues is something that you get to do because God loves you and he's given you the opportunity to do. And just open yourself to the possibility that you get to do it. Now, it's a get to, not a got to right? It's a get to, not a have to. Speaking in tongues is not something that you have to do to be saved, right? If you get up to heaven and, and you say, well, I don't speak in tongues, it's not going to be like, well, God says, oh, I'm sorry, you missed it. You were so close, so close. Why do I say that? Because there are some traditions that would preach that in order for you to be saved, three things would have to occur. That you'd have to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You'd have to get baptized in water and you have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Now, we don't believe that. Right? We don't believe that. That's not what we're saying. It is a, an opportunity. It is a get to, not a have to. But I just kind of want to back up. No, but let, me, let me say this. Most of the times, if you hear a message about speaking in tongues, you're going to go to Acts chapter 1 or chapter 2. Right? You're going to start on the day of Pentecost, and you're going to go from there. Now, the day of Pentecost is a, is, a, is a powerful thing. It is a pinnacle, pivotal moment in the, in the foundation of the early church. But I don't just want to start there. That's where we, that's where we see it, but I don't want to start there. I, I kind of want to go back even into Genesis. You see the person and the work of the Holy Spirit all throughout Scripture. Because sometimes, if we're not careful, we think that the Holy Spirit just shows up in Acts. Like, whoop, there he is, right? He comes on the scene like he's this new part of God, and here he is, and he's doing tongue stuff, and it seems kind of weird. No, no, no. I'll go back to the beginning. If you go all the way back to the beginning in the book of Genesis chapter 1, this is the Spirit of God hovered over the waters, right? And that is the Ruach of God, the breath of God. In the New Testament, the word would be pneuma, the breath of God. Hebrew, Ruach, Greek, pneuma. How many have ever used a pneumatic tool? 
right? A pneumatic tool. The pneumatic tool, it is air driven, right? Is the air that gives the compressed air that gives it the power to be able to, you know, drill or put in a nail or something like that. The power that's in that tool is, is pneumatic. That's where they get that word from, the Greek word pneuma. So the, the breath of God. You go in a little bit, I'm not going to be able to do a comprehensive thing about this tonight, but you go a little bit further on in the book of Genesis and you see that the Holy Spirit comes upon people, comes upon artisans when they're building the temple and gives them the special ability to execute the work of God on the earth because that's what the Holy Spirit does. He's executing God's plan, God's work on the earth. You go a little bit further and you see Je uh, Moses and uh, he's in a bit of a trouble and, and he gathers the 70 prophets together and the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they prophesy. Right, The Holy Spirit is empowering people to do things in the Old Testament to carry out the work of God and you can continue on and on and on throughout the Old Testament. Now, there's something interesting that I want to pause at. Two things in the Old Testament that we'll see in the New Testament on the day of Pentecost that God kind of redeems. The first one is this, is the Tower of Babel. You remember that story, the Tower of Babel? When the people were so unified in one attempt that God had to confuse their language. See, because you say, why did God do that? You ever wonder that? Why did God do that? And some will say, because they were going to build a tower all the way to heaven and reach God. Well, if you look more closely, they were violating God's command from the beginning to be fruitful and multiply because they decided at the beginning of that chapter to say, we are going to stop here and we're no longer going to be fruitful and multiply in the earth. It is good enough to stop here. They were going against God's original command and mandate for humanity. And so God confused them and their languages and so that they could continue to do what he called them to do. The second thing is when Moses got to, they got to Mount Sinai, right? And Moses said, hey, y'all wait here. God's going to give me a word up there. He goes up there. The people act crazy. They make a golden calf. They start worshiping him. He comes down. There's this crazy stuff. 3,000 people die that day, right? So those two things, Tower of Babel and Mount Sinai. So as we go all throughout the Old Testament, we can give example of, after example of the Holy Spirit working. You come to the New Testament, and you hear Jesus beginning to talk about the, the Holy Spirit. He says that the Holy Spirit is, the, is our paraclete, right? Is the one who's been summoned to our side to help us. He is the spirit of truth. He is the spirit of wisdom. He is the spirit of comfort. He, there's power in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is partnering with the Holy Spirit while he is on earth. And he tells his disciples that when I leave, he makes this crazy statement. He says, when I leave, it's going to be better when I leave. Because the Holy Spirit will come. Now, I don't know about you. You could say, what would be better than Jesus in physical, visible form? You ever said to yourself, if Jesus were here, then I would do this. No, you wouldn't. Because look at the disciples. Peter was just as big of a goofball as you and I. Right? So Jesus could be right in front of us, and we probably wouldn't act any different for the long haul. He says it's better because the Holy Spirit's going to come and it's going to be different than the Old Testament. He's not just going to come upon you periodically. He's going to take up residence and live within you and you'll have empowerment to live the life that he's calling you to live and he'll bring unity and comfort and wisdom and truth at all times. But he says, I must go for the Holy Spirit to come. Okay? So then, the resurrected Jesus. I'm working up to a point, all right? Jesus does his whole thing. He's murdered, right? He's put in the grave. Three days later, he's resurrected, and he goes to find his disciples, and where are they? They're huddled up in a house afraid, right? They're not nearly as brave as the women. I'm just going to make that point, <laughs> right? Without the women, they wouldn't have believed. They're huddled in a corner. Jesus comes, reveals himself to them, and it says something very unique. I'm going to give you my opinion theologically. You may disagree. That's fine. Daniel can work it out after I'm done. Right? It says that he breathed upon them. Breathed upon them. Breath. What did God do in Genesis when he animated man? Breathed the ruach of God into man, which animated man, brought man to alive. My belief is that when Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, breathed upon his disciples, the Holy Spirit took up residence in them and regenerated them as new creations. The pneuma in Greek, the ruach in Hebrew of the Spirit of God regenerated them. They became new creations. The Holy Spirit took up residence in them. He didn't just periodically come upon them. Okay, now, he then told them something else. You go to the book of Acts. He said, 
Go to the upper room and wait. Wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now, some people would say this when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They would say, well, you know, I'm saved. The Holy Spirit lives within me. I've got all the Holy Spirit I'll ever need. I could see how you would get there. But I'm just asking a question. Why did Jesus tell them to go and wait? Now, I can attempt to answer that for you. Because you're going to have to answer that for yourself. Here's what I believe. Because I believe there's something, there's a subsequent baptism of the Holy Spirit. Subsequent. After salvation, after the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, living in you to empower you just to, and regenerating you as a new creation. There's two different words used for baptism in the Greek. There's one that means to dunk or kind of immerse. There's another that is used, it means to submerge and kind of keep there. And it's used for an ancient uh, pickling recipe, the Candor's pickle. And it's this word used that when you would take a cucumber, right, you put it in a pickling so uh, solution, if you leave it there long enough, it changes and becomes what? A pickle. It's submerged. And every part of that solution has seeped in all the way to the very inner, most inner part of that cucumber, and it has changed it. Change the flavor, change the profile, change the taste, change everything. That's the word that Jesus uses when he says, wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Right? So when you're saved, you're just like, if anybody's brave enough to get in that cold water tonight, you're going to gonna be dunked and you're going to come back out. You're going to be a new creation, all those things, right? We, we believe that, that symbolic of that. But the baptism, the subsequent thing that Jesus told him to wait for is a, is a pickling. Like, God wants to make you a pickle, right? He wants to pickle you with the Holy Spirit. And he says, wait. Did you ever consider that? I think sometimes we get so hung up on the tongues thing that we don't see the progression that Jesus is saying. So what do those 120 followers do? Exactly what Jesus tells them. Jesus tells them in Acts. Let me read this to you. This won't be on there. So guys, good luck following me tonight. I changed some stuff on my way here, all right? Here's what he, here's what he says. Well, I'll tell you when I'm, I'm getting to my notes, okay? He says this. Do not ju leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's Acts chapter 1, uh, verses 4 through 5. Okay, then you go to Acts chapter 2, and you see the day of Pentecost. Now, on the day of Pentecost, they were all in the upper room, waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. And the Bible says that when the Holy Spirit came, he appeared like tongues like fire over their head, and they were baptized, pickled, in the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance or gave them the ability to do so. Okay, now you remember the Tower of Babel. Okay, now don't remember the Mount Sinai. Okay, after this experience... Peter goes on to preach, and he preaches on the day of Pentecost. It's during the day. He preaches. They're speaking in tongues, right? 3,000 people are added to God's kingdom. They're saved. 3,000 people get saved. How many people died at Mount Sinai? 3,000 died when the law was given. 3,000 were added when Jesus fulfilled the law, and the day of Pentecost came. Also, what happened, the unity that was brought by the speaking in tongues, it said that people from surrounding countries, surrounding places, understood what the people were saying and heard the gospel in their own language as these people were speaking in a language that was not known to them. The confusion that was caused at the Tower of Babel that would hinder God's plan was now brought into unity by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the gospel was going forth to, 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 pro, to push on God's plan. Right? So in one day on Pentecost, God redeems Mount Sinai, and he undoes or redeems what happened at the Tower of Babel by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Just think about that for a moment. It doesn't just appear in Scripture unconnected or disconnected to what God had done all throughout Scripture. The Holy Spirit is the ultimate unifier. He unifies us because he's the spirit of unity. Okay, and they spoke in tongues. Now, we understand and we see that in Acts chapter 2 that they were speaking a, a legitimate language because people heard. 
that language. They heard the gospel in their own language. Now what unfolds throughout the rest of the book of Acts, I think Acts chapter, we see it in 2, we see it in 5, we see it in 9, I think 11 and 19. There's four, or five or six places where we see a pattern in, in the book of Acts. The pattern that we see in the book of Acts is that when they came together and they prayed and the Holy Spirit came upon them and tongues were spoken. You'll never find a verse that says when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will speak in tongues. You don't find that. But you see a pattern, okay? When the Holy Spirit came upon them, they spoke. Came upon them, and they spoke. Now, question you have to answer is this. Is the book of Acts prescriptive, or is it descriptive? I would venture to say it's describing some things to us, and it's a pattern that we can follow. So we see it happening. So the Holy Spirit was doing this work, and people were participating in the work of, of the Holy Spirit. Now, the thing about the book of Acts is, is you, if you flip from one chapter to the next, you're not going from one day to the next. Break out a historical timeline, you're going to see that over the course of years, this happened, okay? And it's being recounted by, by the writer of Luke, who was Luke. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he wrote the book of Acts, part one and part two of Luke's, of Luke's writing. So we see that. So now we get to my notes, okay? I just thought it would be important for us to go there and come all the way up. By the time we get to Paul writing to the church of Corinth, it's been a lot of years. A lot of years since Jesus was resurrected, a number of years since the upper room, and Paul is writing to the church of Corinth, and he starts addressing them uh, in 1 Corinthians about the gifts of the Spirit. We're not going to go through all these gifts tonight in chapter 12 and in chapter 14. It's where you're going to get the most understanding about the, the gift of tongues. And he, has, he talks about two things. He lists all these gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. And he's writing to them. It's important to understand he's writing to them because they've written a letter to him. Asking some questions. And guess what? He's writing in a bit of corrective way. Because people are weird and the Holy Spirit isn't. All right, People are figuring out these gifts of the Holy Spirit and they're acting a little bit out of order and a bit crazy. Has anybody ever been in a Pentecostal charismatic environment that you thought was a little bit crazy? Raise your hand. Okay. Did you walk out of that environment saying, yeah, I don't think that's for me. <laughs> okay. Why is Paul writing? Because people are weird. The Holy Spirit isn't. Part of the reason why I think so many of us are not open to speaking in tongues is because we don't have the information. We have a bad experience. We have a bad experience. Okay? And if bad experiences are going to be the litmus test for us to never engage in certain things, you know, then, I don't know, I mean, I've eaten a lot of food and gotten sick, but I still keep eating. You know what I mean? I just, I just keep doing it. I keep doing it. Uh, <laughs> I keep doing it. It shouldn't be the litmus test. It should be, okay, Lord, what do you, what, you said it in your word. Right? And so what we have is we, we see this. I want to make a distinction between the, the gift of tongues in a corporate setting. Paul talks about this. He says in chapter 12, hey, there's a, a gift of the Holy Spirit. And these are the Holy Spirit's gifts. They're not your gifts. Like you don't have any gifts. The Holy Spirit has them all, and you have the Holy Spirit. Okay? Make, make that distinction real quick. We've got the Holy Spirit. He's got all the gifts. We don't have the gifts. He's got them. And he says there's a corporate gift. All right? A, a manifestational gift. Where someone, someone could give a message in tongues and the corporate stand up. They would give a message in a language that none of us understand in here. And then what would happen is there would have to be an interpretation of that so that we could all be edified by that. All right? So someone just stands up and they start speaking in this unknown language and there's no interpretation in the room. Chances are that individual was out of order. You know, like Jack Nicholas in that movie, you're out of order. You know? They'd be out of order and it'd be incumbent upon the spiritual leadership to tell them you're out of order or let's wait and see what's going on. All right? So that's a, a corporate gift to bless the corporate. But there's also this distinction. Now, this is my understanding of it, okay? You may have a different one. There's also a distinction between there's not just a corporate gift. There's also a personal grace of speaking in tongues, what we would call a prayer language. How do we know this? Because Paul makes a statement, I pray in tongues more than all of you. We have to deal with that. Does that mean he walks around Corinth and Galatia and Ephesus just speaking in unknown syllables because he can? No, because he already said, if it's out loud, where everyone can hear it, and I don't mean someone just praying a little bit loud, but if it's out loud, then there must be an interpretation so that others can understand what's going on and how God is working. Okay? So I'm going to talk for the rest of our time, which how much time do I have? 
Okay, how much do I want? I hope I'm not boring you. All right, so the first couple things here. You have to say three things about speaking in tongues, okay? The first thing I want to say is this. It's biblical. It's biblical. And it's biblical whether we feel like it's biblical or not. It's biblical. So we have to look at what Scripture says. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2, okay? 14, verse 2. So our contention is every single Christ follower can have the gift or the grace, as we should say, of having a prayer language. We believe it's for all. Remember, it's a get to, not a got to. Okay, he says, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understand him, understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. So for he, or an individual who speaks in a tongue, does not speak to men, but to God. No one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. So what, Paul, what is Paul saying? If any single person in here has a prayer language or speaking in tongues, you don't understand it. You're not speaking to anybody else. You're speaking directly to God. Matter of fact, the Holy Spirit, we'll unpack this more, is actually praying through you and speaking mysteries directly to God. It is a direct line to God. Not that you can't pray in your mother language and not that you can't access God, but there's something extra about this. There's empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to skip all the way to verse 14 and 18. We'll come back and fill in the middle later. He says, okay, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Just let us know. When you pray in tongues, you won't understand it. Paul. Now don't forget about Paul. Paul's not some just unlearned, uneducated individual. Paul's perhaps the most educated individual of all the writers of the scripture. Paul is brilliant, highly educated. That means that when Paul became a Christ follower, he did not check his mind at the door. Right? He wrote the book of Romans. Come on, I still don't understand it. All right? He wrote that. He wrote the book of Romans. So he's highly intelligent individual. And he says that when I pray in a tongue, my mind is unfruitful. I don't understand what's going on. My mouth is moving, but my mind is not connecting with that. So he says, obvious question, so what shall I do? What, will I, what shall I do? He says this, I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I'm going to do both. What's praying with my understanding? Praying in English or whatever your, your native language is. Paul says, I'm going to do both. I'm going to do both. He says, I will sing with my spirit, but I'll also sing with my understanding. Okay. Otherwise, when you're praising God in spirit, how can someone else who is now put in a position of an inquirer say, Amen to your thanksgiving since they don't know what you're saying? What is he saying? He says, if you're praying in the spirit, it's going to be pretty impossible for your buddy to come over and say, Amen to that. Right? Because if someone's saying amen to that, they're probably understanding what you're saying. But if you grew up Pentecostal charismatic like me, just hearing tongues, you're like, amen. <laughs> so he's literally saying that when you're doing this, your friends and the individuals around you, they're not going to understand because you're not praying to them. You're not speaking to them. You're speaking directly to God. Directly to God. He says, you are giving thanks well enough, but no one else is edified. What does that mean? You're praying, and it's good for you, but nobody else is understanding or being blessed by your prayer. It's going directly to God. It's just pretty simple. He says, I thank God. Here's verse 18. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. That's an interesting phrase right there. Meaning that Paul prays in tongues. Not corporately, but privately. So the gift that we talked about is corporate. This grace is private. It's for you. It's for you on your personal relationship with God. For you, for you and him. Paul describes it as praying in the spirit and with the spirit. He prays in the spirit and with the spirit. And it is a spirit-empowered activity. It's not something that we make up. We're going to get there in a moment. You say, well, I, have you, how many have ever heard, or maybe a pastor's told you, uh, uh, those people are just speaking gibberish. They're just making up the syllables. Have I ever told you that? If they haven't, that's great. I grew up Pentecostal charismatic, so people told us all the time, you're just making that up. And I'm like, maybe I am. You got to really think through that. It's the Holy Spirit-empowered activity. Here's something else. If we skip to verse 39, here's what Paul says. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. Do not forbid it. Some churches forbid it. I'm not going to name any. I mean, it wouldn't be beneficial to do so, but some people forbid it. 
I, I really think what happens is we often criticize what we don't understand or we often don't engage in something that we don't understand but sometimes there's very there's wisdom in that but when God has given us something to look into and some gift to have it it is it is incumbent upon us to to seek the those things out and try to understand them more it's easier to deal with it if you just say eh, it's done but Paul I, I do it all the time all right so it's biblical we see that it's biblical let me say this it's a benefit number two it's a benefit all right benefit Paul says this in verse 4 of chapter 14. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. So he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. I think it's good to just define the word edify. What does the word edify mean? It means metaphorically, here's what it means, to found, establish, to promote in Christian wisdom and affection and grace, virtue, holiness, blessedness, and to grow in wisdom and piety. All right? Or look up the, just the regular definition, which I think is cool. It means to build a house, erect a building, to build up, to build up from the foundation, to restore by building or to rebuild or repair. Guess what Paul's saying? When you pray in the Spirit, there's something being built up in you, something being restored in you, something being renewed in you, something being established in you, right? And it's like, have you ever been in a situation where you didn't have the words to pray in English or your native tongue? You didn't know what to pray. Maybe it's a, it's a thing like uh, your, your, your spouse or your child or a family member, friend, they just got a, a stage four cancer diagnosis and they have three weeks to live. And beyond there's an issue with your child and, and they don't know what to do and you don't know what to pray. Like you believe God, but it's like, you know, you're Job and you don't know what to say. There's, there's situations after situations where we encounter where we don't know what to pray, but if you have the grace of the Holy Spirit to pray in tongues, he will begin to pray through you and you can build yourself up, edify yourself. And you say, is it me doing it? No, it is a partnership with the Holy Spirit to restore and renew and establish faith and hope and things on the inside of you. And why would God give you this gift? Because he loves you and he's never leave, he will never leave you nor forsake you. And he wants to empower you to live this life. Look at the opportunity that we have where you don't have to come and get prayer from Pastor Daniel. You can, but the same Holy Spirit lives in you that lives in him, and the same power of God that can flow through him can flow through you. Wherever you're at, whatever you do. You know, it's interesting that you can hear stories after stories of, of missionaries going on the field in some remote country, and they did not believe in speaking in tongues, but when they got on the field, they recognized we need something more. Yeah. We need a power that is greater than us. And they find and discover there's this thing called praying in the Spirit. And they edify themselves. Sometimes it doesn't matter what your theology says. God is not bound by our theology, right? Our, our ability to capture or understand him. I believe in theology, but if, uh, if we have a theological perspective that doesn't line up with scripture, then maybe our theology is wrong. Not the scripture, right? To edify yourself. Listen to this in, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. He says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind. Be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And you can say, well, Paul's saying praying in the Spirit. He just means praying like according to the Holy Spirit. Like the Holy Spirit is leading him to pray. Perhaps. Perhaps. But he uses this phrase multiple times. If you go back to Corinthians, he uses praying in the Spirit directly in relationship to praying in tongues. Is it possible that when Paul uses praying in the Spirit, he means praying in the Spirit? praying in tongues you go to the book of jude which he did not author but it says but you dear friends by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the holy spirit keep yourselves in god's love as you wait for the mercy of our lord jesus christ to bring you to eternal life you see that phrase praying in the spirit praying in the spirit let me just pause for a moment i don't know how many of you pray in the spirit or don't and that's cool just think about the last two years when we had no idea what truth was. No, what, we didn't know what way was up, what way was down, what was left, what was right. Everybody had their opinion, right? 
What if we, we thought, you know, Lord, I don't know what the truth is. I don't know what to say. The only thing I can say right now is probably a word of criticism or just coming from a place of anger and frustration, regardless of which side of the aisle that you were on on any given issue. But you could say, you know what, I don't know what to say, but I could really use some edification. I could pray in the Spirit. Paul says you speak in mysteries. When you're praying in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit can only pray the truth. And can speak things over your life and your situation and, and this country and your family that it's a mystery that you don't even know. When you're praying in the Spirit, the, it is the Holy Spirit, it is God Himself p- praying on your behalf, interceding for you and over you and through you. Think about that. How many of us would like to type, tap into some of that? And it's a free grace that He gives us that if we're not careful, we'll reject because we don't understand it. Or because we can't control it. That's me. I like control. Anybody else? I love it, you know. But this yielding to the Holy Spirit, it's a benefit. It's a benefit. 14, again, he says, If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Like I said, when he prays in tongues, his spirit, the Holy Spirit that came to live within him, that he's yielding full control to, is praying. His mind isn't understanding it. So it's literally like you could be praying in the spirit, be like doing your thing in the spirit, and like, I I just ate a banana the other day. Or, you know, "Mm -hmm, I got to do these things. I got to do that. Your mind is going bing, 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 bing. Because your mind isn't understanding the words that are coming out of your mouth. Your mind is unfruitful. It's not producing, you know, positive fruitful things because you can't understand it like every, right now what's going on when I'm speaking in English your prefrontal cortex is engaged right making sense of what's being said thoughts that are passing through the frontal lobe of your brain are, are being synthesized into maybe certain actions or maybe you're taking notes which you should be I'm just joking I'm just joking I'm just joking just kidding and you're thinking about it and your, your mind is engaged in that way What Paul is saying, your mind is not engaged in that way when you speak in tongues. So, you want to know what's fascinating? Here's a fascinating thing. 2006, a guy guy named Andrew Newberg, psychiatrist at the uh, the University of Pennsylvania, did a study. Did a study, did brain scans of people speaking in tongues. He used this thing called SPECT, which is this. It's a single photon emission computed tomography. I didn't know what that was either, okay? Someone knows what that is? No, okay, you're just acting like you do? Okay, okay. Uh, I didn't know what that was. Basically what they do is they hook your brain up and they, they give you this liquid and then they can track your brain because the liquid lights up different parts of your brain as it's being activated. Okay? And so they took these five ladies who, who uh, were like Pentecostal charismatic and who prayed in tongues on a daily basis and they gave them activities to do and they tracked their brain while they were doing certain activities like daily activities, thinking, writing, doing stuff and they were watching their brain and they were watching that prefrontal uh, low, the frontal lobe just light up, bing, 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 bing. And they said, okay, now what we want you to do is we want you to pray in tongues while their brains are hooked up to this, this spect thing. And they watched their brain light up, and they found four things. This is fascinating, okay? Four things. Here's the four things that Andrew Newberg discovered. He was just observing. I don't think he himself is a believer. He just wanted to uh, dissect and, and, and observe the claims of people praying in tongues. First thing is this. They found diminished activity in the frontal lobe and language center of the brain. Diminished activity. Again, frontal lobe is responsible for thinking, feeling, judging, and personality. Okay, the, the frontal lobe, that, all that. They found diminished activity. But you know what they also found? They found that the speech center was lit up. The speech center of your brain is like right here by your ear. Okay, right here. Little part of your brain. So when you are thinking of a sentence, let's say when you're in a a heated discussion with your spouse or friend, and they're talking, but you're not listening. You're thinking about your comeback, right? (laughs) right, You hear just enough of the argument to be able to formulate your counterpoint, your rebut, your rebuttal. And you're thinking what they're saying, and you're like, it's flying through your brain, and you're formulating your sentence. You formulate the thoughts, and they become synthesized into some sentence. It passes over to the speech part of your brain. The speech part of your brain throws it to your tongue, and you fire off that rebuttal. That's how it works. Not when you're speaking in tongues. Diminished capacity in the frontal lobe. But the speech center is going bing, 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 bing. Syllables, words popping into the speech center, and your brain is popping to your tongue. Now, you're choosing to do this, okay? It's not like the Holy Spirit takes over your body and you become a marionette puppet, all right? 
and these syllables are coming out. They showed activity in the brain and you're saying syllables that you don't know. Is it possible that when Paul said, when I pray in the spirit, when I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Is it possible that Paul was unknowingly making a scientific statement? Is it possible that Paul was saying, for when I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my frontal lobe shows diminished activity while the speech part of my brain is lighting up? Is it possible? This is 2006, University of Pennsylvania. This appeared in the New York Times back then. So this isn't like some Christian, you know, article, which is, to me, even better. So that's the first thing they found. Second thing they found is diminished level, or the levels of adrenaline de decrease in the body. Meaning, what do you do? <sighs> what happens when you're stressed? Not only does cortisol release, but or when you're in a heightened sense of awareness, adrenaline just bam, 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 bam. When you're anxious, when you're afraid, people who pray in tongues, it literally has a physiological effect in the body. Adrenaline <sighs> decreases. Wow. Uh, number three, we have a diminished sense of control. That's when some people say, when I pray in the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit came upon me, I felt a little out of control. Now, he's not going to make you run around and smack somebody in the face. I'm not talking about that, all right? It's a diminished sense of control. Okay, sense of control, which means the part of the brain that makes us feel in control showed decreased activity. The part of the brain that makes us feel in control. I mean, you can be so afraid of fear and you just try to find control, right? But the part that makes us feel in control, diminished activity. We, what does that mean? We are relaxing as adrenaline decreases and we are yielding control to the Holy Spirit. Yielding, bending our will to the will of the Holy Spirit as he speaks the will of the Father over our lives. Number four, it showed increased in the peri... I'm going to mispronounce this... Uh, parietal region of the brain. This part of the brain takes sensory information and tries to create a sense of self and how you relate to the rest of the world. Okay? And it showed increase in that. Here's what the psychiatrist said. Here's his quote about this finding. The findings make sense because speaking in tongues involves relinquishing control while gaining a very intense experience of how the self relates to God. Let me say that again. The finding makes sense because speaking in tongues involves relinquishing control while gaining a very intense experience of how the self relates to God. When you pray in the Spirit, you begin to see how you relate to the Father and how the Father relates to you. And I would venture to say, if you struggle with a negative self-image like I do, if you've got a negative narrative like I do, you've got an opportunity to repeat and rehearse those narratives. Anybody have negative narratives that seem real but really aren't? Come on. You say negative things about yourself. You interpret every situation through your lens of negativity. So you've got an opportunity to speak the truth, speak your narrative, or you can pray in the Spirit. And I believe somehow, in some way, it is a mystery, but you will begin to, you're, you will begin to understand yourself in relationship to the Father and how He sees you because the Holy Spirit is going to declare over you who you are, who He created you to be, not what you've just done. Right? Think about that. I don't know. We can go home right now after that. That's just, look that study up. University of Pennsylvania, 2006, Andrew Newberg, psychiatrist. I think there's even a little video out there. So it's a benefit. Here's the last thing. And we're almost done. It's a choice. It's a get to, not a got to. You don't have to. Doesn't make you any more saved. Doesn't make you any more appealing to God. You know, there's not a ranking system in Christianity. Those who speak in tongues and those who don't. No. God isn't like, ha, ah, now I can use them. No. It's a choice. Listen to what Paul says in verses 14 through 15. He says, uh, for if I pray in a tongue. You know, if I leave here and go to White Castles. Or if I'm nice. Or if it's a choice. Right? If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? What shall I do? He says, I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing it with my understanding. You have a choice. Paul says he's going to do both. He's going to do both in the appropriate situations. 
right? I'm going to do both. If. It's like you have a choice. God is never going to force himself on you. Right? It's a choice. You don't have to follow Jesus. Well, yeah, I do. No, it's a choice. Yeah, there are consequences. He's not going to force you. You don't have to read your Bible. You don't have to come to church at 6.30 on a Friday. But you did. Did Daniel make you? Did Gretchen make you? Yes. <laughs> so I said yes. <laughs> we felt a lot of pressure. All right. <laughs> you have a choice. God never forces himself on you. He says, hey, you, you get to. I don't know who, who's going to play, if it's just Titus or the whole band. I don't care who, whoever it is. You want to go ahead and come. That's fine. But if I, and he says, I will, I will. Now, here's the thing. That's all the, all the, the, uh, the theology. Okay. Can I tell you my, my experience? So I'm 37. Just turned 37 in January. I grew up in this my whole life. Grew up in a Pentecostal church. My grandfather was a, an Assemblies of God minister on my dad's side. My, grandma, my grandpa on my mom's side for a while was an Assembly of God pastor. I was practically born in the pew. Like born in the pew. Born in the pew. I, I grew up with all of this. It was never weird to me because it was just my normal. I was eight years old. June 7th, 1993. How do you remember that? I wrote it in my Bible, my King James Bible, because that's all we could read at the time. There was a camp we went to. It was called Camp David down near, uh, I don't know where it was, somewhere close to here. Forgot. Deloge, near Deloge, Missouri. You know Camp David? Oh, okay, you're shaking your head. I thought, man, you know Camp That's amazing. So anyway, the church owned this camp. And they had at this camp, we'd go all the time, they had an, an, uh, a, uh, an air, A-frame chapel open air, okay? No HVAC, just wooden pews, and it smelled like off bug spray because in the middle of the summer. And there was a guy speaking to all of us as kids, and he said, if you, any of you in here tonight want to come and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you want to speak in tongues, come forward. So I decided at eight years old I was going to go forward. And I went up, and I went to a, off to the right-hand side. I could still, I could close my eyes and see it. Eight-year-old, I knelt down, and the, and the altar was the, um, the stage, had brown carpet on it. And I knelt down, and I prayed. No one prayed with me. No one prayed for me. But at eight years old, my prayer was in my humble way. I said, God, I want to speak in tongues. And I did. I remember these syllables came. I think it's easier for children than it is for us as adults. These syllables came, and I began to pray in, in tongues, and I began to cry, and I felt the presence of God in such a powerful way. I got up after the service was over. I ran to the... ...on my June 7th, 1993. Did it for a while, and... You know, started to think about it, became a teenager. I'm like, I don't need any of that anymore. That's weird. I was eight years old. Was it really real? You know. Then we went on a missions trip to an Indian reservation in White River, Arizona, Apache Indian Reservation. And we were having services out on the basketball court that night. And uh, we were praying beforehand. And, and I just remember walking out of the church and onto the basketball court and walked onto the basketball court. And man, the presence of God was just so strong. You, you could feel it. And there came a time for the altar, and, and uh, we were just praying for people. And I just remember I was praying, and I was like transported right back to when I was eight years old. And there were people coming forward with issues that I had never faced in my life. And I just remember being 14 years old and just praying, and just praying in the Spirit. And the power of God doing some amazing things. And I'll tell you, if having the gift or the grace, however you would say it, of being able to pray in the Spirit is really what has sustained me as a pastor. I didn't want to be a pastor. It was the last thing on my mind. It was not the plan that I submitted to God. I was going to be a missionary in some other part of the world. And there have been countless times where I have had no idea what to pray. I had nothing left in the tank. Right? And all I had was, I'm going to pray in the Spirit, God, because I want to quit. This is too hard. 
I hate it. <laughs> I don't like people anymore. You know, you know. I just I remember one time specifically I was driving uh, on bulls, and I, I was I had some argument with somebody, and it was not fun. And I was just I had nothing left to say, so I was just praying in the spirit, and, the, and God just was in my car with me, and He spoke very clearly to me. I didn't know what I was praying, but I just knew that I needed to. I need to get a hold of God in some way. You know what I mean? Praying in the Spirit. Here's the last thing I'll share of my experience because I got stories for days. Um, I started working for Joyce Meyer Ministries in 2007 right out of college. And uh, a number of years later, I, uh, 2000, it was 2011, I got the opportunity to go on the road and work uh, with the volunteers and, and do an offering and you know preserve seating and all of that. And one of the guys came forward, and, and uh, my son had just been born in April, and uh, we were, I can't remember what the time frame was, we were in Phoenix, Arizona. Anyway, this guy came forward, and I, I sat him, and then the next day, we went to lunch, and he was there. His name is Frank Galvan, and Frank said, uh, yesterday, Josh, when um, I met you, the Lord gave me a word for you, and I really wanted to pray about it to be sure if it was him, and I said, Okay. And he said, Lord told me to tell you, the time that you spend away from your son, he's going to redeem. Right away, I said, whoa. I don't know Frank. He lives in California. I live in St. Louis. My son had just been born. One of the discussions my wife and I had was, is it going to be okay for me to be gone, you know, every two weeks for three, four days to do this? And my wife was like, I really think this is an opportunity for you, and it's what the Lord wants. And so I was so concerned about missing things. He said, he will redeem the time that you spend away. He said, the next thing he said was, and the Lord showed me that he's got your, your son in his arms and everything's going to be okay. And I thought, well, that's not comforting. What's going to happen? Fast forward 10 years. That's always in the back of my mind. My son is having some problems with uh, emotional you know, regulation. He's having some trouble in school with some fine motor skills and just not progressing at the pace that other kids are progressing. And every year the school says the counselor, can, he'll be fine, he'll catch up, and he's not. And we're getting kind of concerned. So we take him to this uh, place to get, uh, it's occupational therapy, and they do an evaluation. And they tell, oh yeah, they observe all these things, and they're like, yeah, he has this and this and this, but he can get therapy, and it'll be good. And I'm like, okay, great. Well, it was really hard, you know, because I thought to myself, why, why didn't I know this earlier, you know, as a father? Like, why couldn't I, I be a better father and, and, um, and get help? And, and I thought about all the times I got frustrated with my son, and, and he just couldn't do it, and I didn't know. I remember I called my dad, and I just wept on the phone, and my dad said, well, son, if, <laughs> he goes, I've done a lot more wrong than I have right, and you're okay. And I remember sitting in my living room, in the spot that I pray, and I was praying, and I didn't know what to say. I was just praying in the Spirit, and I felt the Lord speak to me. He said, you remember 10 years ago when you stood in Phoenix? He said, I told you I had your son in my arms, and he's going to be okay. He said, it'll get worse before it gets better, but trust the process. That was a year ago today. We had his year evaluation. My son has made so much progress. God is just so good, and he's so faithful. Why do I tell you that? You're going to walk out of these doors tonight. Next week, there's not going to be a revival. It's not going to be five days worth of preaching. But the Holy Spirit is with you everywhere you go. And he lives inside of you. And may he not be your last resort. May he be your first go-to. Right? Your first go-to. Why, why, why would God give you the Holy Spirit and create this goofy, weird thing we call speaking in tongues? Because he loves you. He loves you. And he's always with you. And he'll never leave you nor forsake you. And he wants to help you more than you want to help yourself. And he wants you to know that wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, if it's not Sunday morning between the hours of 9 and 12, when you can come to a service, he's there. When you're at your worst, he's there. When you're royally screwing it up, he's there. And he wants to help you and set you free. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So here's my thing. I'm going to give you two things to respond to tonight if you want. The first one is this. Maybe you say, you know what, Josh? I don't know if I'm ready to say I want to speak in tongues. 
what you can say is, I want to be baptized. I want to be pickled. Because what I'm not saying is, is that if you're going to be baptized, then you will speak in tongues. I'm not going that far. You're saying, I just want that subsequent thing. I'm going to go to that upper room. I want to wait to be pickled, right? I want to be a pickle for Jesus, you know. I want to be baptized. And those of you that helped Pastor Daniel and Gretchen pray, you can come forward. If that's you, I want to give you an opportunity to pray with somebody. The second one, if you say, you know what, I want a, I want a prayer language. I want to pray in the Spirit. So that's, you. That's, a, that's a step, man. That's a stretch. Yeah, it is. And can I take some pressure off of you? Here's, I don't have a formula for it, okay? I don't have a formula, but it's just something that you can follow, okay? Is this. Number one, all you have to do is ask. Father, would you, would you give me a prayer language? You ask, right? And then you, you yield. Say, Holy Spirit, I, just, I give you the speech part of my brain. I yield to you. And then you thank him. Maybe it happens tonight. Maybe it happens tomorrow. Maybe it happens a month from now. I heard one pastor say that he'd been praying for it and asking for it, and his wife woke him up and said, what are you doing? She said, he, she said you were speaking another language while you were praying. He said, well, then it finally happened. He said, I've been praying for it. You thank him. You say, you say Father, would, I thank you. Would, you. would you give me a prayer language? And I, I just submit control, and I trust you. And you say, thank you for, for filling me with the capacity to speak in tongues. You receive it by grace through faith, just like you do salvation, right? Now, here's my encouragement to you tonight. Are you going to feel awkward? Yeah. Is, are you going to maybe get some syllables in your, in, in your brain that you don't know if it's gibberish? Probably because your mind's going to be unfruitful. Okay? Here's my encouragement to you. Say it. But what if it's weird? It will be. Say it. Do it. I've been studying Spanish since I was 14 years old. It still feels weird. I'm just now it's my mind starting to be fruitful. But risk, risk not being in control. Risk it because the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that comes through that. Would you stand with me? If either one of those things, prayer teams will be for it, I want you to come boldly in faith. Say, I want to be a pickle or I want to speak in tongues. And pray with somebody, but I'm going to pray over each and every one of you. Would you all bow your heads? I just want just this, an opportunity for us to take a step of faith. First question, if, any, if anybody in here, eyes closed, heads bowed, say, I, I want to be baptized. That's the step I want to take. Just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody here say, you know what? I want to, I want to, the grace of a prayer language. Would you raise your hand? Raise your hand. Raise it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to pray for you, and then you can respond to a prayer team member. Heavenly Father, we come to you in this moment, knowing that in Hebrews you are full of grace and mercy and compassion. So, Father, I pray for those who said, I want to be baptized. I pray, Father, you would baptize them. We know that, Jesus, you are the baptizer. You baptize them in the Holy Spirit. More power, more strength, more faith, more hope to trust you. And Father, I pray for every individual that say, you know, I want to, I want to pray a prayer language. People pray in the Spirit, as Paul said. Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus to fill them with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. We pray that fill them with the evidence of speaking in tongues. If any of you hear that you do pray in tongues, may you just quietly pray in the Spirit pray in the spirit as we pray over this house we pray over this church we pray over the future thank you jesus thank you jesus father i pray that 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 what is done tonight and over the course of this week it will not fully realize it we may never fully realize it but there are there are roots going down there's something new being birthed in this house and for this season and for pastors daniel and gretchen and and the staff and what you're going to do through them father may it be as paul said in ephesians exceedingly and abundantly above anything that they could ask for or imagine according to the power at work within them which is the power of jesus we pray for the activity of the holy spirit to be free to flow in this place 
place as a group of people have have been empowered father to pray in the spirit and that chains would fall off and lives would be changed and, and people would be healed not just physically but emotionally and psychologically and that lord you would begin to just do things that no eye has seen and no ear has heard and no mind has conceived we thank you for filling us with your spirit in jesus name.